Uh, our next speaker is Neil Davidson, uh, author and activist, and uh, he's going to talk, and, and his books are available <laughs> there as well, so uh, there will be an opportunity for you to browse the bookstalls. Um, so, uh, Neil, I don't know if it was... Uh, if it was a privilege to be there or not a privilege to be there. But uh, I think some of us were quite intrigued about somebody last December uh, at obviously a tremendously difficult time going to uh, Brazil. And Neil was there and will explain to us what he saw and what he heard and what he experienced there. But also, I think the whole thing about Brazil at that time that concerned all of us, I think, across the world, was uh, that rise of the right. And he's going to explain a bit about that and, and maybe what we do about it. <laughs> Thank you, Neil. Okay. Um, last year, of October, I was invited by some Marxist professors at the University of Sao Paulo to go over there and give some lectures um, or even in their development. It was this is uh, an anniversary of bicentenary event for Karl Marx. So there was something to call events like that. And this is the very beginning of December, no doubt. Now, um, I was only in Brazil and only in Sao Paulo for six days, so I don't pretend to be a great expert on Brazilian politics and history. There are people here who are experts in Brazilian history and politics. They'll talk about those. So I'm going to talk part of what I saw in some reflections on the kind of more general experience of right wing populism and um, Bolsonaro obviously represents. Um, it's interesting, I arrived at, uh, at Sao Paulo Airport, I'd flown there from Frankfurt. It took longer to actually drive in from the airport where I was staying than it took to fly from Glasgow to Frankfurt. And that's something because I've never been in Los Angeles, I've been in New York, the city is absolutely dominated by cars um, and very slow moving cars. Uh, so I was able to see quite a lot as we're traveling in at extraordinarily slow speeds uh, to get into this. This is Monday morning, rush hour, right? To get into the, the center of the city. Uh, you have to pass through the area where the favelas are. And when people say favela, you, or I did, people tend to think of kind of shanty town type constructions with canvas and, and wood and so on. But it's not like that. The, the, the buildings are actually made of brick uh, on the side of the hills as, as, as you drive through them. And you can see people actually building uh, these, 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 these ramshackle kind of houses as, as we were driving through. Um, not very secure, very, very dangerous. I mean, if you've experienced a kind of rainstorm in Brazil, and imagine that water coming flooding down a hill, to a house that isn't really securely built, but actually it's been built up in this kind of way, is very dangerous. And of course, these areas you pass through have no sanitation, uh, no, some of them have running water, um, the electricity is stolen off the grid. In many cases, you know, there's no real facilities or anything, and people live there in an informal sort of way, both in terms of where they live and the kind of relationship to the, the, labor, the labor market. Um, as we get further into the city, um, go through some of the working class areas and the kind of outskirts and head into where I was staying, which is a tame, which is a very bourgeois area, and we think about gated communities. Here there are gated buildings, buildings where there are massive steel metal kind of instructions to stop people breaking in, people with guns and um, guarding them, um, and barbed wire. Now, this is extraordinary for someone from Britain or Europe, possibly, you know, driving from a them to the university, which you have to cross the river to do this since about four or five miles away. It's almost every building, certainly every, every, every house, had kind of rolls of barbed wire at the top of it. And often, again, guys with guns standing around outside. And this is again, extraordinary. I mean, the fear of the bourgeoisie uh, of, of the kind of the, the masses in Brazil is extraordinary. And, and um, one slogan that I have, a right wing slogan associated with Bolsonaro, was that human rights are for right humans, meaning the right kind of humans, who are, of course, black people or indigenous people. But you know, this, this is. This is the kind of stuff that is spread and expresses the kind of deep fear and hostility that the middle classes and those of us themselves have towards not just the working class, but particularly the kind of uh, black and indigenous sections of that class. So there's a kind of, the people you know, telling me that was there, that the kind of class divisions are, are stark and extreme, and the kind of divisions between the middle class and the working class are actually much starker than they would be in, in parts of Europe or parts of North America. Um, which by the way is the kind of story that I've been talking about. And particularly, um, there's very little black uh, indigenous presence in the middle classes. So these lives are, I think, separated in ways which I think we might find hard to actually understand. And in the city itself, if you go into the heart of the city, um, the mayor of Sao Paulo is a, is a right winger, and 
last year, I think, closed down some of the hostels that made available for crack cocaine addicts or addicted to other drugs. So if you go into the middle of the city, one way out, you see people doing deals, taking drugs, sleep and pavement in the, in the side of, of, of quite prestigious buildings at railway stations and so on. Um, I mean, you see this kind of thing in some North American cities like Los Angeles, New York and so on, but this was like incredibly visible and open and people just staggering about. And loads of people with no homes pushing their entire, um, you know, worldly goods around in supermarket trolleys in extraordinary numbers. I mean, you know, this is something, there was great poverty in Edinburgh and Glasgow, but it's not that kind of poverty. You know, people are just hundreds of thousands of homeless people. Uh, wandering around, some of them addicted and so on. So this kind of thing all hits you. When you get into the, the city, the first thing you, you pick up is this. And of course, everybody said, don't have your window down if you're in a taxi, or if you've been driven about, make sure that you don't have your window open, or people will come in, they'll try and attack you, they'll try and steal money from you, and so on. So great. <laughs> you know, so obviously, this is a kind of, you know, some kind of nervousness when you go into this kind of situation. There, the political mood was actually a kind of suspended thing. It's after Bolsonaro got elected, there were some very big and relative demonstrations early in November, you know, protesting at what happened and, and, and that, you know, visible opposition to him. That kind of died down by the time I got there and there was this feeling of people waiting to see what was going to happen when he actually came into office, uh, as he did on the 1st of January. So there's a kind of tension, but not a visible displays in the city of, 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 of mass opposition at this point. Um, it's interesting that there had been, back in 2013, the so-called June days, Massive demonstrations starting in Sao Paulo and then spreading throughout the rest of the country. Initially, in opposition to in increases in bus fares, uh, the movement of free fares and so on, was actually in opposition to this kind of, kind of very basic kind of demand. But of course, uh, you know, the, the, if you uh, are working class and rely on, on, on buses, then it's obviously an extremely important issue. It then generalised into other issues as well. What was interesting about that, those demonstrations, though, was that they seemed to consist of two different groups. On the one hand, kind of precarious workers, often people are relatively newly come into the city from the countryside. On the other hand, the kind of young, traditional middle class, who kind of both protesting at that point with the, the workers' party government, but for slightly different reasons, which reasons which kind of overlap and weren't entirely clear. So there's a kind of way in which even popular opposition to the government in power, since 2003, it the workers' party, in a sense can be incorporated into in a narrative about corruption. Um, of course, there's corruption on both sides, <laughs> or all sides, uh, of governments in, in, in Brazil. But it actually doesn't necessarily have a left-wing expression. It's important to note that a lot of the, the, the working class in Sao Paulo, and some of the other bigger cities as well, is relatively new, comes from the countryside, often is quite conservative and religious in its views, uh, and isn't necessarily immediately swayed by left-wing positions. I was speaking to the guy who's trans translating what I was saying in Portuguese, Pedro, who is a young lecturer in Rio. And he says that he lives in a flat and there's a woman who comes out from the favelas there to clean it, he's a cleaner, and she does a number of other flats in the building he stays in. It's a four hour round trip for her from where she stays to come in and do this. She's on, off the books, this is an like informal sector kind of work like so many people in, in, in Brazil and Sao Paulo. And she said, oh, she didn't vote obviously because she's not like registered or <laughs> you know, she lives in one of these, these kind of undocumented kind of areas. But she, she, was, you know, she was sympathetic to Bolsonaro and what he was doing. Because what he was doing was going to tidy up the crime. He said he was going to smash the criminal gangs and so on, the drug dealers and all the rest of it that plagued her where she lived. Now, Bolsonaro won't do any of this. Or if he does, he'll just allow the police to go and shoot your know, enemy on sight. You know, and then clear that's a kind of solution. You can see how a kind of right-wing argument that we can make your life better in some way, if there's no, no other way in terms of money and so on, but at least we can get rid of, of drug dealers and so on. How that's some kind of presence if there isn't a left-wing argument countering it. And a left-wing position that actually says what the solution might be. And the Workers' Party, I think, unfortunately, didn't see any sign of doing it, having been in power or office for quite a long time, and did make some reforms. I mean, let's not pretend they didn't do anything. But certainly, as soon as the kind of the crisis hit in 2015-16, uh, the BRICS, the kind of Brazil, uh, Russia, South Africa, South Africa, and even China, all began to suffer um, severe economic problems in, in around about this time. The bourgeoisie seemed to have decided they were going to the Workers' Party they longer would do anything to remove it from office charges of corruption against uh, Dilma and against Lula and so on. But actually we need to pull in people whose, who, whose interests would actually lie in a left-wing government and left-wing politics, but who pulled in behind a kind of right-wing argument which Bolsonaro ultimately was able to, 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 to build on. Now, um, the university itself, where I spent about a week uh, giving some lectures, was obviously a site of um, left-wing opposition to the military dictatorship. 
after 1964, and I, I imagine again no, this is some of the, the, the people going to demonstrate uh, a couple of months ago. The lecturers themselves and the, the staff at the university uh, are coming under a lot of pressure not to talk about Marxism, not to talk about left-wing ideas, not to criticise the dictatorship from 1964 um, to, to, to 85. Um, and there's been a lot of, well, already, you know, spies in the classroom, students sort of reporting people uh, for, for, for making statements that could be interpreted as being left-wing, and so on. Noises coming out of the, the ministry saying we're not, we're not going to allow people to, to indoctrinate young people with their terrible Marxist ideas, uh, we're not going to allow people to criticise the heroic um, dictatorship of, of the, 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 the generals and so on. Um, how much of this is actually going to be legislated for is difficult to see. A lot of it may be just gaslighting, you know, kind of making people frightened so they shut up voluntarily rather than actually imposing these kind of laws. But certainly there's a great deal of concern uh, that, that there's going to be attempts to just rein in what people can actually see um, by, 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 by legal means or, or otherwise. Um, people were joking that I was probably the last Marxist intellectual that actually paid to go out to, to Brazil to lecture uh, when once Bolsonaro came into power. And there's a element of seriousness in that. You know, nobody knows how that's going to, that's how it's going to play out. Um, Okay, so, and I mean, that's going to filter all the way down. So even post-grad candidates and so on will be, we'll stop with them being interviewed to see those bad ideas before they're allowed to actually take a few pieces of course. Okay, so two, two concluding uh, points. Um, Bolsonaro doesn't have that kind of unified base for what he's trying to do. Some of the people who support him are conservative, really right-wing people who are opposed to gay marriage or opposed to, 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 to kind of social, liberal kind of positions, which have been quite strong. Um, in Brazil, and they're, 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 they're middle class people hate, the they're traditionalists who hate that kind of thing. Then there's the big bourgeoisie, the loggers, the, 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 the large um, ranchers, and the people who want to tear up the Amazon and, and, and basically attack the indigenous rights to be able to do this and so on. They have obviously economic reasons for wanting Bolsonaro to, to, um, to be in power. What makes him slightly different from the kind of right wingers in power in, in Europe, and Poland and Hungary, and potentially in, in Italy and so on? Uh, is one that the kind of arguments that he's making are not about migrants coming into Brazil from outside, they're about the actual population of Brazil, the black and indigenous <coughs> population, who they, who they, who they, they wish to start hated against, and in the case of the indigenous people, to destroy the territories they have reserved for them uh, along the Amazon and elsewhere. So it's not external migration of Brazil, it's the international population of Brazil. And the second thing is, of course, that the military in Brazil play a much bigger role in political life than they do in any of the European countries where there are right-wing forces. And of course that's, that's the problem, that clearly, even after the dictatorship fell in 85 or from 85, there was never really an attempt to totally reform the way in which the army operated. And so there's a kind of, he's got military backing, but it's divided too between those sections that want a kind of total neoliberal solution to Brazil's problems, and those are more interested in kind of alliances with the US and military um, alliances and aren't so worried with the economics. It's not, it's not a unified Based, I suppose what I'm saying. That's partly a good thing, because it means that he isn't this, he isn't a, you know, there's going to be divisions within what Bolsonaro is trying to do. However, that isn't automatically going to play out the advantage of the left either. Um, so, what, what I think he will probably do, uh, he may try and throw a few bones towards his traditionalist supporters by attacking gay marriage and so on, but I don't think that's going to be the main focus. I think the main focus is going to be tearing up any restrictions on logging and the kind of attacks on the, the envir environmentally catastrophic things that are trying to happen in the, in the Amazon, and, and basically allowing those big capitalists to do what they like, uh, free from any kind of constraints of the environmental kind of rules, which but, but formally are actually very good in the at the moment. That will be the main focus of what he's doing. That means he'll probably have to attack things like the, the landless peasant movement or the urban homeless movement and the kind of those, those mass kind of movements, uh, social movements, which are actually fighting for for rights in Brazil. I expect that will be where the showdown will start to, to come. The problem is the Workers' Party, having been in power for so long, are having reduced a lot of their arguments to arguments about corruption, rather than actually about class power, are now not in a position in themselves deeply divided in terms of what they're doing. The rest of the left, again, there's, 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 there are a number of groups as there are everywhere. So the question is what can unify people, and uh, what can actually, what would a strategy be that doesn't just mean trying to re-elect um, the, the Workers' Party again? Those are the questions that are facing the Brazilian left at the moment. Um, it's, you know, it's the Sao Paulo itself has 20 million people in it, and it's the seventh biggest city in the world. It's a phenomenal place. The tensions, the class differentiations, and so on are astonishing. And I think it's always been one of the places where resistance has actually started. I think we can expect it to be one of the places where it starts again when things kick off. Thank you.